Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for February 17th, 2021. I'm Joe Lynch. I am welcoming back to the set Andre Green, chair of the Somerville School Committee. Andre, how are you this afternoon? I'm great. Glad to be here. And I'm so glad you came back. I didn't scare you off from your last appearance and first appearance. It has been years. You haven't scared me yet. I don't think you're going to anytime soon. <laughs> Andre, a couple of quick things. Um, this is school vacation week for the Somerville school system. It is. Uh, the kids are enjoying a little bit of a break from uh, laptops and everything else that they utilize to do uh, learning these days. But I wanted to make one a uh, couple of quick announcements is that the grab and go meals program for kids is up and running at East Somerville School, the Healy, the West Somerville and the Winter Hill. And those will run right through, I assume, Friday or Saturday of this week. They are running, running as normal. Yes, indeed. Excellent. School vacation time also means uh, that parents have an, a Herculean feat of trying to keep the kids active and engaged, uh, especially on February vacation. So I just wanted to do another quick shout out that in conjunction with the city of Somerville, Somerville Public Library, the Somerville Education Foundation and our very own Somerville Media Center. Um, our classes filled up very, very quickly for out of school time programming run out of the Somerville Media Center. And I'm happy to say Heather McCormick is very pleased with the attendance. So we are running those camps and those um, classes right through Friday. On to tonight, you have a momentous occasion as chair of the school committee. You will be uh, voting on the memorandum of agreement with the Somerville Educators Union. Andre, take it away, kind of lay the table for this. Sure, so you know, I think the main takeaway I want, I want to give people is that Assuming, as I believe they will, um, the school the school committee tonight authorizes me to sign the MOU. Um, I believe firmly it is a deal that brings our students back. Um, starting the week of March, March starting week of March first, um, pending buildings, which I'll come back to in a second, we will start to start with our highest need students coming back, um, and then starting two weeks after that, again pending building building readiness. We will start with our English language learners, our pre uh, and our some of our other special eds, and then we'll start phasing in pre-K, kindergarten, all the way through, basically at a, a week or two at a time until we're up to capacity. So the hope is that by the end of March, I'm sorry, by, by, by April break, excuse me, everyone will be back. Um, obviously, this is contingent upon buildings, um, buildings being ready, which we believe they will be. Actually, the, the news is that we expect to be receiving the occupancy for the high school, which I got to walk through on Monday um, this week, and then we'll start with the East and the Capuano, and we project to be on place. Um, we also will be sharing with the union per, per agreement the airflow metrics for these buildings as they come online so that they can review them and, you know, they have the perfectly reasonable position that this whole deal is contingent on some of making lots of investments in the buildings. So how do we know that how do we know it's working how do we know we're getting what we say we're getting seems like a reasonable safeguard to us so we will be providing that and so can continue on that and attention on of course you know there's this variant but you know if we, if we listen to the cdc's you know projections we listen to we project that we will be we, that we will be fine community wise um but as the cdc said over the weekend if COVID, you know, continues to run rampant or runs more rampant because of the variant, then you should probably stop and pause and look what you're doing. That's what our, that's what the MOU suggests. Um, actually, I spent the weekend reading the CDC guidance, and basically what it says is, if you want to reopen schools, be like Somerville. And so, like, I think we're on the right track, and I'm looking forward to seeing um, faces in, in the new high school, which, by the way, is gorgeous. Uh, starting soon. I, I heard. You're not the only school committee person I talked to, Andre, and everyone's saying the same thing, that the investment that this city made into a new high school uh, certainly will dazzle a lot of people. It, it, it is night and day, um, you know, and, and, you know, we kind of obviously still not, it's still not finished um, in a lot of places like we still have an auditorium, 
but like even like the, the things that were just renovated, like like the field house, it's like night and day. Like it'll blow people away. Well, it's amazing what you can do with a a, a building, um, a building that has served its purpose for a hundred plus years, um, with a little forethought and a and a lot of money. It's amazing right. and, what you can and, do. And you know, why I hope that we, we aren't. I hope it's not a hundred years before we do this again. I hope it's not. I hope it's by fifty. So I hope it's we've had it for a while. But my feeling is. If you do something once in a lifetime, you should, you should do it right. And I think we've done it right. Excellent. So you were talking about the school, uh, the physical plants themselves. So congratulations, first and foremost, to the school committee, the superintendent, the mayor, and the uh, educators union for coming to an agreement that we hope has everyone's interests at heart. I think it does. I think, you know, it, you know, the, the educators came with, you know, very real concerns and very real, you know, thoughts about what does it mean to actually run a school on, in, a, in a pandemic. Um, we worked collaboratively over the space of months to address those concerns, you know, address those concerns in a way that we felt actually still meant that students would come back. And I think, you know, like any compromise, I think, you know, if you, if you gave the teachers, teachers union, truth serum, they, they things, things they don't like, and if you gave me truth serum, things I don't like. But I think ultimately speaking, again, this is a deal that returns students to school in a collaborative way. And I think that, that was very important, at least to me personally, um, that it just, it, it never struck me as making a sense to try to force teachers back if they weren't comfortable, because, you know, beyond that feeling wrong against my progressive values, it also didn't strike me as the best way to actually get kids educated, right? Like a teacher who is petrified and resentful and mad because they've been forced against their will, isn't gonna do their best teaching job. And if our goal is actually to, to have what's best for our kids educationally, that's a collaborative process and I'm, and so I'm glad we were able to make that happen. Yeah, I think, you know, just my casual thought there, Andre, if you don't like the job that you're doing or you're afraid of the physical facility that you're in, you don't do a right. terrific job. And I so. also think, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's true. I also think, you know, we know this because we've seen it play out in multiple issues over time. The government official that the average family trusts most is their classroom teacher. And so if we really want to see people who are, they themselves be nervous about coming back, come back, the most powerful weapon, ways and tool we have is their teacher saying, I'm looking forward to seeing you in class on Monday. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, when I talk to the little ones in my family, it's, you know, so tell me what you did this week. And within the first uh, three things that they mention is their teacher. Mm -hmm. Because we as caregivers and you as a, as a dad, you're giving over the well-being of your child to a stranger, so to speak, um, for eight hours a day. Six yeah, no, hours a day. You know, um... You know, when I, when, you know, my daughter's in first grade now, and when I was, when we, were, when we were looking at schools, one of the things we kept in mind is that Somerville is by and large a K-8 system, right? And then we were starting for pre-K, so pre-K to eight. That means whatever school I, I handed my kid to was going to have it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's a huge investment of the most, you know, and it was precious thing, precious thing in my life. So yeah, it was important to me to know there was a community that I trusted. Well, let's hope it works out. But one of the things that um, I, I noticed during your opening that you had said, trying to get them back into the school buildings. Um, one thing that I think most people may be aware of, but should be aware of is that there are two physical facilities that won't be coming back anytime this spring or summer. Uh, I'll make that a short term thing, right. is the Brown School in the Winter Hill. Right, the Brown, the Brown and the Winter Hill require more sense of work. Um, you know, the Brown doesn't have central HVAC, so like that was never really a, a, an option. Uh, the 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 Winter Hill, despite having done some recent work to the windows and roof, is dealing with a very outdated HVAC system. And yeah, there's no right now. There's no perceived way to get them back, back online before the end of the school year. Um, so fortunately, we have not that far away from both those buildings. This quarter billion dollar building with modern HVAC, plenty spacious rooms. Um, so that is the plan for now. Um, and the hope is that we will be able to get the kid, the hope is the kid won't be there long and we'll be able to get the Winter Hill, 
which is where, where you know my daughter goes. Well, not the winter health, the healing. Excuse me, where my daughter goes online enough soon enough that we can use um, that building as much as for as much of a high school as possible. Got it. So, school committee meets tonight, six thirty, six forty-five, somewhere in that time frame. Right. So we meet at six thirty. Um, cause we, we, cause there's some stuff we, we legally, we have to, to finish any conversation about the negotiations in executive sessions. That should be pre, pre pro forma. Um, we will then meet at 645. So again, what I expect will be pre pro forma. People may have make statements, whatever, but it's just a meet and vote in public session. And I think, you know, the negotiating committee, which I am part of recommends passage of it. I think that will probably be the case. Um, and we will, you know, they're already meeting, I think we're meeting twice a week. So today and tomorrow with the union about some of the educational pieces, but we're all, we are all looking, the expectation is that we will start in earnest the week of, the week of, week of March 1st. Terrific news. Um, so that brings me right to um, one thing that has to happen for the high school is the certificate of occupancy. And I notice on the superintendent and school committee's website is that you anticipate that being given- uh, Any minute now. By Friday, hopefully yeah. Friday of this week. So it looks like the pieces are falling into place. Kids will be going back to school that first week in March. And why are you smiling? I'm looking for, I'm looking for something wooden to knock on because it does look like it's all happening. And I'm just like, what kind of, there we go. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Great. I so, think we've done everything we can do to control everything with, with our control. We've done. Now it's you know, building building engineering stuff as I understand, and the virus willing. So so let me ask you let me ask you this, Andre. If there are parents who opt not to send their kids back to in school learning, how are those teachers and those educators going to be able to accomplish the in person learning? and the remote learning kids? So that is one of the things that, like I said, we're, they're meeting right now to figure out. I think both the school committee and the unions agree that the districts where, you know, they've asked the, the same teachers simultaneously teach remotely and in person, that isn't working educationally. Um, so we're trying to figure out how that goes. I think for the students for whom, you know, there, there will be some set of teachers who, for w w whatever reasons that, you know, it's not legal for me to discuss, won't be able to come back. So we will have a pool of remote teachers who we will assign to the people who know they're also staying remote period, full year. For the students, you know, for most of the students who will be in some form of hybrid, the question is how do we, it, it's, it's twofold. Right? And I actually wanna, you know, give both the, the district and the union credit. I think they're both trying to think very creatively about this. It's one, how do we maintain, maintain the sense of a cohesive community when only half the people are in, in the building at a time and also, when you are when you are not in person, which is still going to be sixty, you know, three out of five days, how do you still get the level of intention we want you to get? Um, and you know, the short answer is we haven't fleshed that out yet. That's what we're talking about, like literally as we speak. Um, but I, I, I am confident because the the actual like creativity and thoughtfulness that both sides are putting into this, I am com confident the answer will be good. And we have some time because you know that, that March fourth group, and even most of the people who start March fifteenth will actually be will be in four days a week because these are the high touch, high needs group. So it won't be as you know we move into April and we're starting to really see the hybrid happen. That will have so we have we have time to figure that out. And I think you know what we've seen is that when when the school committee, the central office, and the teachers work together, they get really creative and come up with really good, good answers. So I'm, I'm excited to see what we do. Looking forward to it, looking forward to it. Let's talk a little bit about once the kids go back in, right? And the teachers sure. go back in. Do we have the testing set up for them, testing for the COVID virus? So the, the, the plan is, as agreed to by all parties, is that students who are in four days a week will be tested twice a week, um, Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, Students who are in two days a week will be tested either Tuesday or Friday, depending on which, if they're Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Staff will be tested, will, will be tested twice a week. Um, and, you know, 
we are th thankful to Tusk for their role in helping make this feasible. Um, and yeah, we think we have the, we, th we think we have the, the most robust testing of anywhere anyway of anyone and anywhere. So, Andre, just a clarification: Are we doing uh, individual testing or pool testing? We are doing pool testing, um, and that is really the only way to do at the scale we're talking about in a meaningful productive way. Um, and it's and it's actually the reason why. More so than the than a deep clean, it's the reason why that, that remote Wednesday is so important. It's because if we test people on Tuesday, that we we basically are giving ourselves time to get the results back before people are actually building on th on Thursday. And similarly, test people on Friday, give ourselves a week to get the results back. So, okay. Um, and I think we touched on this the last time you and I were together. I had relayed a story about when I was young in that you know single room log cabin school that I went to. Um, vaccinations were part of re-entry into right. school. What are the thoughts at this point about mandatory vaccinations for educators and kids? So it is some, something we are definitely exploring. Um, obviously it doesn't, it didn't make sense to mandate them before we actually have the testing because, you know, and, and we don't control when that will be because we have the testing the vaccine. Um, that's a decision ultimately at the hand of Charlie Baker. and. You know, so far his vaccine rollout has gotten deserved crit criticism. Um, and, you know, as of right now, there isn't a vaccine approved for, for people under 16, but the hope is that that is coming. Um, you are never gonna find someone who is more pro-vaccine than I am. Um, so certainly to the extent that I have any sway on the matter, the expectation is that as the COVID vaccine becomes available first to teachers um, and then to, you know, eventually when it was approved for children, that the expectation is that some real, people participating in some rural public schools will, 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 will get it. Um, we know that some, you know, I think we mentioned the last time we talked, actually last time we talked, literally the first summer rural public school employees had gotten it in their role as social workers, et cetera. Um, I, would, I would have hoped by now teachers, teachers would be on the list. I have been disappointed in that so far, but soon, you know. Yeah, there still seems to be some debate at the national level with the CDC giving guidance that teachers don't necessarily have to be vaccinated before they go in. Right. There are other states that are overriding that and then and other municipalities overriding that and saying, no, 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 we think it's advantageous for our teachers to be vaccinated. Right. And I, and I think, you know, we would agree with those with those states that have made that call. Uh, I know that some, some states in Massachusetts tried and have since gotten smacked down by the by the state for trying to, to, to teach us out of order. Um, but I, I certainly think that is the feeling of some rural public schools that we agree that, you know, teachers will be vaccinated as soon as possible. We also agree with the CDC that it's not a requirement for reopening, but I think it's in everyone's best interest as a community of learners and a larger community to get teachers vaccinated as soon as we can. Andre, uh, I hate to put you on the spot, but look, I don't know this because I don't have kids in school. Um, or the, does the Somerville public school system or the district or the state mandate that children be vaccinated for the current types of vaccines? And do you anticipate they would be um, mandated to be vaccinated for Corona as well? So yes, um, school children in, in Massachusetts have a series of vaccines that are required. Um, Somerville has, you know, has policies on that. I fully anticipate that the school committee, once there's a child approved vaccine, would move if the state doesn't do it for us to mandate that vaccine be a requirement for entry. Okay. Um, school nurses, I don't often talk about them as much as I should. We talk about the educators. Um, School nurses within the Somerville public school system do a Herculean effort when it yes. comes to kids that are entrusted into their care. Have we provided the uh, Somerville public school nurse nurses or healthcare in in school healthcare workers? Have we provided them with all the tools that they're going to need going forward? So, my my, my flippant answer is I hope so. Um, you know, uh, for a weird quirk of Somerville is that up until it, it actually until June 30th of this year, school nurses are actually city employees, not school employees. Um, that will be transitioning come July 1st of this year. 
Um, so obviously we talk with, we talk with Doug Cresso this fairly frequently, especially this year, because they, they are so vital to our opening plans. Doug Cress um, being the head of health and human services. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and so like every school as they come online, you know, one of the, one of the places we have to give space, which is, you know, the big thing driving hybrid is the need for space. But every school has every school's nursing suite, in addition to having a nurse suite, which is not every school in Campbell has. But we we have an isolation, we basically created isolation wards. Um, they have by our estimate, we have a six-month supply of uh, PPE for every student and staff in the, the district. Um, so we are certainly trying to make sure we, we give uh, our all of our all of our staff, including our nurses, who as you point out, do their clean work every possible tool we can to have them you know be safe and secure as we move into in-person learning i don't want to be i don't want to be debbie downer here but what happens to what happens in the normal course of the day if um one of our students goes to the school nurse and says i'm really not feeling well i need to go home right what so, happens? okay so there's, there's actually a number of protocols for this um, let me start with the with, with the obvious, which is more so than ever before, and we'll be messaging this fairly aggressively. Parents, if your kid says they don't feel well, let them stay home. Like this is not like this is not the year, and next year probably won't be either, to worry about perfect attendance. If your child isn't feeling well, let them stay home. That said, if your child comes in and is starting to be symptomatic. We have protocols to get them off site for testing. Um, we we will be explaining to parents that the expectation is that if we call you because your child is symptomatic, that you will that you will arrange for them to be picked up either in suburbs or somewhere else within 30 minutes of that call. Um, and there, again, there's a whole series of protocols which, <coughs> not being a health public health expert at all, I'm not going to try to say and, and 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 massacre and give people an idea. But there's a whole set of protocols for what happens when a child. Asymptomatic in the buildings, and you know, this is different from the asymptomatic testing that happen twice a week. Got it. So it sounds like, and let me try to put a nice ribbon on this. Um, it sounds like we are light years ahead of where we were last month. Um, I, I I say so. Yes. Yeah. So we have dates. We have identified the facilities. We have an agreement with the educators. We have um, city personnel, such as Director Raish, who's still working on um, guaranteeing that those air filtration systems and the HVAC systems are gonna be uh, up to date, functioning properly, well-maintained, so that when the kids do go back in, um, the parents can feel safe that those kids are in there. My next question, though, takes us beyond um, where we are now which is a question that some school districts are starting to grapple with. Since the kids have lost a, a certain percentage of their learning year, right. are there any talks about doing some type of a system in the summer for these yes. kids? Um, absolutely. I think that, that's so, that is one of the reasons it was so important to get a deal um, with teachers is because that, that actually gives us more options to what we can do this summer, especially especially for our most most needy, our students with the with the highest need of touch from teachers. Um, you know, there is a, and having gotten through the immediate crisis, there is a working group uh, led by the social superintendent Maza um, that is working on how to build the most robust summer program in, in history of Somerville. Um, so that is definitely on our agenda. We are thinking very deeply about how to ensure we get as much touch for as many students as possible this this summer um with details to come and the weeks to come well Absolutely. not only thanks andre not only the high high highly skilled kids that are gonna uh, highly um what's the word i'm looking for here the students who need the most touch students who need the most touch um as you know the media center runs its program all year mm -hmm. round we don't take vacations <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that in a snarky way, but we run these programs all and year round. We could not be more thankful, especially and, this and, year. And, uh, it, you know, I, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago and it involved what are we doing this summer for the kids? And I said, my God, Heather, it's only February. 
you know, let me try to get through the month of February, but he's all going to be there in terms of planning. Right. So first of all, let me reiterate my my immense esteem for, for Heather McCormick. I think I think she and, you know, the whole social media team does amazing out of, out of school time activities for young people. And I couldn't be more thankful. And I think we're going to be leaning on that again this summer. Um, we have been we have been given assurances by the mayor that money will not be the money will not be a limiting factor in our ability to do uh, programming in the summer. I do can, think we can you say that one more time? I just want to get that on tape a couple of times. Let me say it again. I'm happy to say that we have been given assurances by the mayor that money will not be a limiting factor in our ability to do programming in the summer. Um, you Love know, to hear it. Right. Um, and I, you know, I think. We have shown through the children's cabinet, through our school time network, I think we've shown that we we serve our student our, our students best in the city when we do it all together. So I I am sure we we work with some of many senior on its programming this summer and yeah, you know, I'm I'm excited to see what we, we we develop in this out of out of this necessity. Great. I took you forward a little bit, but Andre, any closing thoughts about um what I am sure for everyone involved is going to be a sigh of relief tonight once uh, you and the other members of the school committee vote yes on this agreement. I think, you know, what I, what I, what I really want to leave people with is my immense gratitude. So many people, like, you know, obviously, as a, as a parent, this year has, been, has, has had moments of frustration, right? But I am just... I am overwhelmed by just how many people have worked so hard this year. Um, you know, any teacher who, like, teachers who are doing this work remotely right now are working harder than they've ever worked, right? Um, our, our central office staff, we are working to the bone. Um, you know, the, the negotiating team on both sides spent hours pouring over data, going back and forth, like really trying to come, come up with good, you know, Good metrics, good sense of where the PD is, um, good sense of how to do this in an equitable way. I want to thank my colleagues on the school committee. I want, to, I want like it is. This has been a real full core press to get us where we are. And while we're not done, there's still a lot to be done. You know that that the light at the end of the tunnel is finally the light at the end of the tunnel, not, not onto the train. And some of us, um, as you know, we were talking before the show. Some of us are being prioritized in terms of vaccinations. So on a closing thought from uh, someone who is in the over 65 range, I fully intend to be vaccinated as soon as I can get that appointment. Uh, the appointment system for us, the over 65 crowd opens tomorrow here in uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So hopefully um, any seniors who are watching this, grandparents wondering about what is Andre Green up to in the Somerville School Committee, um, I would highly encourage you to talk to your family and talk to your healthcare provider about being the first in line and I'll arm wrestle you to be the first in line to get a vaccination. Andre Green, thank you so much. Congratulations once again on this memorandum of agreement. Thank to you. Reopen the Somerville Public School System for, for the Somerville Media Center. I'm Joe Lynch, thanks for watching. As always, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, take care everybody.